Pastor Jerry was sharing today for the scripture for the offering, and it kind of got into some of my sermon for, for next week, Lord willing. But, um, but, but God's been really pouring into me some things that I believe is going to be a blessing to the church and the community. Of course, we want to greet our online viewers. Um, and when I go to Tennessee, um, you know, there's people up there that are telling me they're watching the services that are in Georgia and so we acknowledge them. Um, sometimes they go back through the week and they watch the service. And, and um, I'm realizing that, you know, whatever you're doing, there's people watching you, whether it's good or bad. The ugly people are watching you and you have influence in your life. And people are looking at you the way you act, the way you live, the way you handle even difficult situations. Amen. But um, I acknowledge those that are watching online. God bless you. May God continue to keep you and bless you as you Watch the services that you will be a blessing to your household. And um, the sermon that I want to talk about today is talking about the power of forgiveness. How many of you believe that we need more forgiveness in our life? Amen. It's not a very easy topic to talk about, but it's what the Lord has given me. And, you know, some people come up to me and say, Pastor, what a great sermon and 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 I think back on that, and God, the sermons God gives me sometimes are the things that I'm dealing with. There is, there is pain that I have felt, and there's things that I've struggled with. And out of that, in my relationship with God, He gives me things that helps me get through it. And so I just communicate that back with His people. And sometimes God is telling me that He's allowing me to experience things to know the burden so that He can... Uh, be, be a be a communicate with others the blessing of, of of getting through certain things jesus went to the cross he knows what it's like to feel pain he knows what it's like to be betrayed so he has been through everything in life that we have been through yet the bible says he was without sin and he said forgive them for they know not what they do and so every sickness every pain that you're going through every loss that you've had um, he knows God had to send his son to die. He knows what it's like to sacrifice his one and only son that he loves. And so there are things that you're going through in your life. I hope that this can be a blessing to you, but not just for you. Take it to somebody. Share it with somebody. Um, be an example. The greatest sermon you can preach is the, the, your lifestyle, how you live and how you handle different things. Amen. But God is with you. God is leading you. God is guiding you. And... Um, one thing that the Lord shared with me this week is, yes, we are saved. Amen. We are all saved by the grace of God, by the, through the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. But there is something that, 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 that God wants um, in addition to just being saved is having a relationship with him and growing and developing and strengthening that relationship. And there's so many things that God has given me that I want to share with you all in the next few weeks. And we'll be back and forth, so we'll have some uh, speakers in between filling in. But, um, but, but, but the Lord has really been, been showing me some things that I know, I know for sure it's going to be a blessing to you. One of the things that the Lord told me is, yes, we are saved, but in order to get closer to God, He gives us His Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will deliver us from things that are causing pain in our lives, things that are causing us to be far from Him. When, 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 when we find ourselves in a relationship with God, the closer we get to Him, the closer we see where we have fallen short. So if we allow pride to come in the way, we won't look, like Pastor Jerry said, at, at, the, at the plank in our own eye. We're quick to criticize other people. But the ones who are criticizing the most... Sometimes they're using that criticism to cover up their own guilt, their own shame. So instead of looking at other people and trying to figure out the plank, the, 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 the plank in their eye when there's a log in our eyes. So don't criticize people. Focus on yourself and how can you be a better Christian? How can you be a better servant? How can you walk closer with God? When, when Peter got into the boat with Jesus, he says, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. The closer you get to God, the closer of a relationship you have with him as you build and, and, and develop and grow, God will show you things to, to show you there are, there are more things you need to clean up. So when we're prideful and we're not honest, we're not humble, we'll say, I got everything figured out. Let me go fix other people. No, you let God fix them. You work on yourself and let the light of Christ shine through you. Amen. 
David said when he was ready to face Goliath, the same God who, de who delivered me from the, the lions and the bears, this is the same God that's going to give me the strength to defeat Goliath. He walked in with faith knowing that he was going to come out of that. And when Abraham had to, uh, had to sacrifice Isaac, he went up there and he told the rest that was with him, he said, we're going to be back. He knew by faith that somehow God was going to make a way of escape. And, and as you all know the story, there was that ram in the bush. But as you get closer to, to God and, and, and develop, the Holy Spirit will reveal things to you that will bring you into a closer, right relationship with God. Yes, we are saved. Amen. But there are things in our lives that God is still working out. Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Amen. So if we can be open and honest this morning, open up your heart and don't try to point fingers. Look within and say, God, how can you help me? How can you fix something in my life where I can go out and, and love people more and bless people more and be more forgiving and loving and understanding and have patience and peace? And there's so many things that, that God wants us to work on to be a better Christian, a better uh, brother or sister to our, our brothers and sisters in Christ, and just to be a better servant and steward to the things that he has given us. Amen. So the one that I want to talk about today is the power of forgiveness. Father Lord, I come before you today and I give you praise and honor and glory. Thank you for the word that you have given us, Lord. I pray that, Lord, our hearts will be open and receptive to hear what you are saying, God. As you are taking the church to a new level, O oh God, of walking in unity, Lord, in order to walk in unity, we must be able to forgive those who have hurt us and go past that. Let go of the unforgiveness. Let go of the grudge. Lord, these people in our eyes may not be deserving of forgiveness, forgiving. They are, may not be deserving of grace, but Lord, help us through love and faith to forgive those people and to walk away from it and to just trust in you, look to you and give grace and mercy. Oh Lord, and we just trust you, Lord. I pray for those that are watching online that they'll be blessed today. God, I pray for those that are sick that you will bring healing in their lives in Jesus' name as we develop a closer relationship with you, Lord. Show us how we can be, Lord, a better Christian, a better servant, Lord, a better, a better brother or sister to, to those that that other children of God in Christ that are looking at us so we can demonstrate to the world, to the community, to the lost, oh God, who you are. There's so many people looking for truth, oh Father God. We don't need to go around condemning people. Lord, we just need to love them and encourage them. Yes, we, there are things that we, we, you are a God of holiness. You are a God of love. The standard is still holiness. We're going to stand up for what's right. But Lord, but we're not here to criticize anybody. We're here to correct them in love and to correct each other in love that we can walk in love and unity. And we trust you and we praise your holy name. Can we just give God a hand of a praise and, uh, right now for who he is? Lord, we thank you, Lord. We worship you. We know that where two or three are gathered, you are there in the midst. So let me go. And the text this morning is coming from Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 to 35. And it says, Peter came to him and he said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Paul is asking Jesus for a measuring stick of forgiveness, a measuring rod. How often, Lord? And how often should I forgive him? And he asked Jesus, he says, up to seven times. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but how many times? Seventy times seven. And so therefore, in verse 23, the kingdom of heaven. So first of all, Jesus tells him, not seven times Peter, but 70 times seven. I love Peter. I love John. There's certain people that you got to acknowledge. Peter is the one that stepped out of the boat, and he had a little faith when all the, the other disciples were in the storm. Scared, Peter stepped out. And, and, and so many times I love what, what uh, Peter did and his faith in God, even though there are times he stumbled, but thank God he got back up. Amen. And, and so in answering these things, sometimes Jesus responded to questions through a parable because there were scribes, there were Pharisees who were among them, the religious leaders. 
And sometimes God, Jesus didn't necessarily want them to understand what he was saying because in order to understand what Jesus is saying, it has to be revealed to you. He's talking about kingdom things. And many times in life, we are trying to understand things from a carnal point of view. But God talks kingdom. He doesn't talk carnality. He talks kingdom. So you have to understand what God is saying in the spirit so you can apply it to your life. Amen. So Jesus is answering Peter in a parable and he not only says 70 times 70 times 7, but he says, I'm going to answer this in a parable. So here he gives the parable after Peter asks, how often should I forgive my brother? And Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with, with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as... He was not able to pay his master. He commanded that he be sold with his wife and with his children and all that he had and, and that payment be made. The servant, therefore, fell down before him saying, Master, King, please have patience with me. Give me some time and I'm going to repay you. And verse 27 says, the master of the servant was moved with what? compassion why did jesus feed, feed the multitude he had compassion as followers of jesus christ we ought to have compassion for others so this king this master he had compassion and guess what he did he released him and he forgave him so that he had no more debt and verse 28 says but that that uh servant that same servant that was forgiven um he went out and he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Now this was only a fraction of what he owed the king. This was less than what he owed. And so he saw him and he owed him a hundred denarii and he laid hands on him. He took him by the throat and he said to him, pay me what you owe me. In verse 29, so his fellow servant, he fell down at his feet just like he did. And he begged him and he said, have patience with me. Give me some time and I'll pay you. Verse 30 says that he would not, but he went and he threw him into the prison until he should repay the debt. So when his fellow servants, when they heard about this and they saw what had been done, they were grieved and they came and told it to the king. They came and told it to the master, everything that had been done. And verse 32, then his master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant. He said, I forgave you because you begged me. And he said in verse 33, should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was very angry and he delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. And verse 35, Jesus answers finally and says, my father, my heavenly father also will do to each of you from his heart who does not forgive his brother his trespasses. So he is saying that if we don't forgive others, the Heavenly Father cannot forgive us. Uh, there are times in the Bible where we see that God is, God is a God of love. Yes, he's also a God of holiness. And there are times where he rejects unrighteous living. Now, as Christians, we're not supposed to tolerate certain lifestyles. I mean, as especially spiritual leaders in the church, we have to address certain things. If there is someone that's openly living in sin, we have to address that because that is damaging to the body of Christ. Amen. But we do it in love. We don't we don't cast people out. We don't we don't we don't we don't shame them. Amen. We we do it in love. And so and so this servant, so there are times where like the master had to judge. There are times where, where God gave judgment for 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 example, Saul. Saul was anointed to be king. Amen. But Saul disobeyed God. So when we disobey God, it comes with, with consequences. And so God rejected Saul because of his disobedience. So there are times where we are judged. God does judge sin. And, G and God turned away Saul because of disobedience. Adam sinned and was rejected. Cain and Abel, um, Abel gave the, more, more, the, the, more, uh, the, the offering that was pleasing to God. Cain's Abel, um, offering was not, was, was not what God wanted. And so God judged him. And 
And that brought about uh, evil in Cain's heart to where he killed his own brother. That brought jealousy, uh, a, a, a spirit of, of murder. So there are times where we are judged. And this king in this text is judging that servant. Now, he had the opportunity by law to allow him to face the consequences. But he had grace and favor and he allowed the servant to walk away. But when that same servant who had been forgiven had an opportunity to display and express love and forgiveness and grace and mercy. He could not find it in his heart to do it. He was never sorry. He did not have a true repenting heart. He was just happy that he was off the hook. But when it came time for him to give, forgive somebody and express love and forgiveness and, and grace, he couldn't do it. He couldn't find it in his heart. So when the king found out, he said, you're wicked. Because I gave you another chance. I gave you grace. Why couldn't you do the same for your brother? And so he was judged by that. Amen. When we start living in humility and honesty, we must take some risks and expect some danger. So there are people where we are afraid to love. We're afraid to, to you know, we put up guards because we don't want to, to, uh, to be heartbroken. But when we love and when we trust and when we, when we express forgiveness, um, there are times where it, it is a risk that you're taking knowing that you could be hurt. But even if you put up guards and if you put up walls and, 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 and you put up barriers to where you don't allow people into your life, that does not mean that heartbreak won't come. So it does take a risk to openly love someone and reach out to them knowing that the possibility exists that one day they're going to turn their back on you. One day they're going to talk evil about you. One day they may turn into an enemy. One day they may say hurtful things about you and they'll be needing forgiveness. But it takes risks. And unless humility and honesty result in forgiveness then relationships cannot be mended or strengthened. Why so many times we see friends and business partners and, 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 and they go great for years, 10, 20 years, and all of a sudden something happens to where they can't get along anymore. They can't see eye to eye anymore. You know, I had a, I had a boss and him and another guy, they decided to, to go into business together and they decided it would be 60-40. And all the profit, 60% would be to the main guy and, and 40%, I mean, they did good for a while. Eventually it was 50-50. Now they don't talk to each other. Why? They can't see eye to eye on that. They, they, they just can't. And so, and so without forgiveness, relationships can't be mended and and so um there was another guy who was here working and and he left florida and he said i'm gonna go to one of my business partners in chicago and we're gonna start a business together and we're gonna do work together i called him up the other day i said how are you guys doing how's the business going at first everything was going good he said now they don't even talk to each other they don't speak to each other they can't see eye to eye one wants more money than the other one and they can't but, but without forgiveness, these relationships will always stay broken. Without forgiveness, without compassion, without love, without taking some risk. Sometimes being the bigger person means being the humble person and, and saying, you know what, you, you, you go ahead. You take it. And don't let pride get in the way. But we need forgiveness in order so these relationships can continue to thrive. Because at some point in your life, we are all Un, uh, broken human people that are, that are filled with flaws. Amen. Jesus is the only one who walked this earth and was perfect. So at some point in your life, your spouse is going to hurt you. Your kids are going to hurt you. Your brother, your sister, or your parents are going to hurt you. Doesn't mean that we just um, get, get these people out of our lives and we don't speak to them anymore. We have to find grace and mercy and compassion to forgive them and fix that broken relationship. That, that mother yesterday at that funeral service got up and talked. She said the last thing that she said to her son was, I love you, be careful. And that, those were great words because she says his lifestyle was not always pleasing. It didn't always make her happy. It caused her sleepless nights. The friends that he chose, she had no control over it. All she could do was teach him the word of God and allow him to make his own decisions. But, the, but, but in spite of this, whatever decision he made, she still let him know, I love you. Be careful. And so we have to choose wisely the words that we use with our loved ones and, and letting them know that things may not be perfect, but, but I love you no matter what. And so Peter recognized the risk involved in, in, in having a relationship with his brother. And he asked Jesus, how should I handle this in the future? How can I handle this, this uh, unforgiveness in the future? How can, when things go wrong, when things go south, you know, how can, um, <laughs> Pastor Jerry said something the, <laughs> the other day, it made me laugh. Um, he said, when, 
when the, um, something about, I won't say because it's probably not appropriate, but it, you know, if you know Jerry, he's a funny character, but, um, <laughs> um, I see him back there now. I lost my train of thought. I can't say that, but you'll go ask him that. But I love the way he worded it. He's basically, when, when, when things start going south, what do you do? How do you handle that? that? And so Peter recognized that there was a risk involved. Uh, um, so Peter, he asks for limits and he asks for measures. So where there is love, there can be no measure. Sometimes in a relationship, we say, okay, I'll allow you to do this if I do this. Or how much can you go? Or how far can you go? And we try to put measurements together. And so this is what Peter was doing. Lord, how, how many times should I forgive? Seven times? Is that okay? So on time number eight, you know, then, you know, after that, we don't, we don't, we don't speak anymore. And Jesus says 70 times seven. It's not about the number. What Jesus was saying was nobody can, can forgive 400 and was it 90 times in one day? But Jesus was showing that it, it is a habit of forgiving people because they will hurt you they will fall short not only that we will hurt them too we're not so perfect but we will want forgiveness we will want love we will want compassion we will want grace and mercy but where there is love there can be no measure look what uh, ephesians chapter 3 verse 17 says that christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length, what is the width, what is the length, and the depth and the height to know the love of Christ which passage knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. How I many you know that true love, with true love there is no measuring stick, there is no measuring rod. What is the height, what is the depth of God's love? It cannot be measured. And that is the same approach we have to take in life in our situations, with our relationships, with our loved ones, with our friends, with our co-workers, with the boss. So Peter thought that he was showing great faith. He thought that he was showing great love when he offered, out of the goodness of his heart, to forgive seven times. He thought that was good. You know, seven is a pretty good number. You know, that's God's perfect number. So he says, seven times I'll do it, but not on number eight. But the rabbis taught that three times were sufficient. So, so he thought, well, if I do seven, I'm going above and beyond. Because we were taught that we can give, forgive three times. He said, I'll do seven. And would that be enough is what, what Peter asked Jesus. Jesus replies, 70 times seven. 490 times is what I, I, I require. So then the point Jesus is making that love keeps no records of wrong. And that comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. And so this gets us into the habit of forgiving each other. The parable in Matthew 18 teaches the power of forgiveness. How many of you know and believe that there is power in forgiveness? It's not always easy to talk about or do. I mean, maybe it's easy to talk about, but when it comes down to it, can you really forgive these people? Jesus on that cross said, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. There's people that are hurting you. They don't even know that you're up crying at night, worried, sick about it. They don't even know what they've done to you. And you're holding that resentment in your heart. You are a prisoner to you, the, oh, the pain of the things you can't let go of. Those people who have hurt you, they're sleeping peacefully. And you're up at night crying and, and weeping and wondering why they hurt you. I, I heard this story about a, a guy who got bit by a poisonous snake. And he went to the hospital. And, and um, he didn't know what he deserved. So so he went back out to the garden to find that poisonous snake and ask him, why did you bite me? What, did, what have I done? We, we don't need to go back and find that poisonous snake and ask, what have you done to receive that ill treatment? You just love and you move on. You forgive and you walk with God. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Don't dwell on that pain. Don't dwell on the past. You ask God for forgiveness and get on your knees and say, Lord, give me the strength to forgive this person. Give me the strength to move on. I don't want to carry this anymore. I don't want to hold on to this weight anymore. This thing is making me sick. How many of you know that unforgiveness and pride and, and holding a grudge will literally physically make you sick? There's people who have lost their mind because they cannot let go of rejection. They cannot let go of the things of the past and the pain. And these things will make you sick and cause depression and anxiety. Now you have to go to the doctor and get medication because you can't sleep at night because you're holding on to the pain and you're holding on to the past. And these things will call physical sickness in your life. Do not be a prisoner of the things that people have done to you by not releasing it 
We got to be able to let go of that stuff. Salvation of, is of grace and is given unconditionally. So this parable is not talking about salvation. We are saved. And so God demonstrates his own love towards us in the book of Romans chapter 5 verse 8. In that while we were yet sinners. That's why he went to the tax collector. That's why he hung out with the sinners. Because it's not the saved that needs a, the, 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 the well that need a physician. But those that are sick. We go to the doctor when we're sick. So people come into the house of the Lord. Sometimes they're sick. And we're not here to criticize anything. Anyone. This is a hospital for healing because we say we serve the God who is the great physician. He knows all. He, he, he gave us many members but one body that are to walk in unity as they did in the book of Acts chapter 2. So that when the power of the Holy Spirit fell, they were in one accord. And that is the God that we serve. And so we, he saved us while we were sinners. And he loves people. They, they are his children. But this parable is not talking about salvation. It is talking about forgiving one another. And so he says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. If in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so the servant in the parable went through three different stages. I want to go through these three stages and then I'll let you go home. Amen. And I want you to come back next week because God has given me a powerful sermon for next week that I, w I believe will be a blessing to you. It's sort of a continuation of this. Uh, and, and Jerry said it this morning. It's like the blind leading the blind. And so we'll get into that because we can't lead people if we don't know what it is to follow Jesus. It's like you're leading a blind person and you're blind yourself. Amen. So we're going to get into a little bit of that next week, Lord willing. But this servant in the parable, he went to he went through three stages of uh, experiencing forgiveness. First, he was a borrower in verse 23 to 37. It says that he, he, he owed money to his master. He owed money to the king. So he knew what it was like to be a borrower. He borrowed money. He could not even repay the money. He was given grace. He was given mercy. He was shown love. Amen. He told the king if he was forgiven, if he was given enough time, he says, I can pay back this debt that I owe. Sometimes we owe a debt and we'll call and try to get that debt canceled. Some people go to the doctor and say, I'll never pay that bill. It'll, it'll get written off. Um, but, and, and, and my mom, one time she had to do a procedure and it was like a $30,000 procedure. And a donor uh, 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 sent the money in and paid that. And, and, and sometimes our debts are paid. Jesus paid our debts on the cross. This borrower knew what it was like, what it felt like. He experienced forgiveness as a borrower. The king, why did he experience that? Because the king had compassion somebody had compassion on him somebody gave him a second chance he took the loss and forgave the servant the king he took the hit he said don't worry about you what you owe me i'll let it go don't worry about it move on with your life and and be blessed you and your family he saved them from being put into prison for owing debt for being a borrower he saved them from that the servant was free uh, and he and his family would not be thrown into prison. The servant was not deserving of forgiveness. There are people who will say, well, I don't think they deserve to be forgiven. I don't think they deserve grace. I don't think they deserve mercy. This servant was not deserving. So it wasn't that he deserved it. It was purely an act of love and mercy that the king demonstrated. So you don't have to forgive people because they deserve it or try to use a measuring rod. It's an act of love and mercy, even though they don't deserve it. We were not even deserving of Jesus Christ dying on the cross. Adam and Eve had one command uh, that, they, that they couldn't break, which was to not eat of the fruit of the tree. And they broke that. Jesus didn't have to come and, and save us, but he did. He could have left us in darkness for disobeying him. And there are many times where we disobey God, but a man fall down seven times, but he get back up again. We don't stay in that sickness. We don't stay in that sin. We don't stay in that pain. We get up and we trust in God and we have compassion on others. So the servant was not deserving of it. It was just an act of compassion and love and grace by the king the second thing that this man experienced other than being a borrower he knew what it was like to be a lender there was one person that would always call and ask me for money all the time all the time and I got advice from an older wiser person he said you know what let him borrow the money because he won't be able to pay you back and he'll stop calling and you know that worked <laughs> I loaned the money and but I had in mind they were not going to repay me 
And so I didn't expect anything. See, sometimes we expect too much from other people. We hold them to a standard that they cannot live by. We set them up for failure. Sometimes we go to the bank. Uh, I was be told a story by a, by a pastor. He went to the bank. They loaned him $5 million to purchase a property. And they did not expect him to be able to pay it back. He had a time limit. And when he came with the $5 million, how many ever years later, they were shocked because they thought he couldn't pay it and they would make all the money on the interest and everything. But they were shocked. They were not happy when he brought the money, the $5 million that they raised to purchase the property for the church and for the community. They were banking on him to fail. There are people that will loan you things expecting you to fail. Amen. So that's what he, he was experiencing. He knew what it was like to be a borrower. He knew what it was like to be a lender. The servant left the presence of the king and, a f and, and found a fellow servant who owed him less than what he owed the king. Not even the, the same amount or not even close to it. And so this debt that he owed was insignificant compared to what the servant owed the king. Instead of sharing that joy of forgiveness. And he, he mistreated the servant and he, met, he demanded that he paid the debt that he owed. The debtor used the same approach as the servant. This is what he said to him. He literally said the exact thing that, that the servant said to the king when he was in debt. Now he's a lender and somebody's asking him, reaching out for help. And he says, have patience with me and I will pay you all of it. The unjust servant, the wicked servant, the Bible calls him, was unwilling to grant to others what he wanted others to grant to him. That right there alone will preach. He was unwilling to give to others what he want, wanted others to give to him. There are things we want people to do for us. We're not willing to do for them. We hold them to a standard that we cannot live by ourselves. And so he was not willing to do what he was expecting somebody else to do. The servant had the legal right to throw the man in prison. He didn't do anything wrong legally. Because this man owed him money. I was reading this morning in, uh, I believe, Leviticus chapter 20. And all the things that were deserving of being stoned and killed in the Old Testament. And I'm, I'm sure I would have been stoned and killed. But after reading that thing, I said, man, how do you live by all these rules and, and regulations? Legally, he was in the right standing to punish this guy and put him in prison. But morally, he didn't have the right. Because God told him, this is, you are wicked. You, uh, you are unrighteous, unjust. So sometimes we get so caught up in legalism. Yes, there are things that according to the law is not wrong. But what about morally in the eyes of God? The law might say do this. The law might say bow down and worship Nebuchadnezzar. But what does God say? What, how do we look in God's eyes morally speaking? So he was looking at things from a legal standpoint. You're deserving of being put in prison. You need to pay back this. The Bible says he held that man by his throat and demanded that he paid him back. But morally speaking, God says you are wicked. He had been forgiven himself. He and his family had been spared the shame and suffering of prison should he not have uh, spared the servant the same way he was spared. So he knew what it was like to be a borrower. He knew what it was like to experience being a lender. And the final thing that he experienced was knowing what it was like to be a prisoner. And that comes from verse 31 to 34. The king delivered this man from prison, but the servant put himself back in prison. The king didn't put him in prison. The king gave him a chance. He spared him. He gave him grace. He gave him mercy. Go, you and your family. Don't worry about it. I've forgiven you. Don't even mention it. I love what Dr. Mann says. There are times when, 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 when the Bible says, um, I believe in the book of Ezekiel, he reads it almost every time we get together, where, where God says, I'm going to cast your sins into the sea of forgetfulness, never that they'll be remembered no more. And there are times we'll come to God and asking, I love the way Dr. Mann puts it, we'll come to God asking God to forgive us of something we did 10 years ago. And God says, what are you talking about? I've already forgiven you. It's in the sea of forgetfulness. So, so when people forget, when you forgive people, don't mention it. Don't talk about it. Don't use the measuring rod and don't use a, a, a record keeping of wrong. And so, so this is what the prisoner was doing. And, and, and the king released him and his family. They said, you know, you can, you can go free. And he was out of prison, but he put himself back in prison. 
by doing to the servant what he what he didn't demonstrate the the grace and mercy that he received the world's prison is the is the prison the worst the world's worst prison is the prison of an unforgiven heart the world's worst prison is the prison of, a, of an unforgiven heart and we put ourselves in that prison because we have the choice to release it and let it go God has shown us grace and mercy, but yet we can't find it in ourselves to do that for somebody else. And so if we refuse to forgive others, we are only imprisoning ourselves when we refuse to forgive others. And we are causing our own torment. You believe that unforgiving, an unforgiving heart will cause you to be tormented. You're holding on to these things. You can't sleep. You need pain medication just for the depression and anxiety. And you're being tormented. Some of the most miserable, miserable people are people who do not forgive others. When you don't forgive, you put yourself in a prison. These people only live to imagine ways to punish the people who have done them wrong. You know what? I'm going to find a way to get back at you. I remember what you did to me last year. I remember what you did to me five years ago. I remember what you did ten years ago. And one day I'm going to repay you. These are some of the most miserable, bitter people that have no joy. They, have, they don't have a repentant heart. They are not humble. They are full of pride. And they're holding on to those things trying to figure out how can I get back at you. They are really only punishing themselves i remember i think it was uh, a celebrity i don't want to mention his name because i don't know if it's the right person but he said he was abused by his stepfather and he was a little boy he was abused and he 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 saw his stepfather abuse his mom and he said one day i'm gonna grow up and as he grew up i believe it was terry cruz he grew up and when he got big he said i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna get big and strong one day and i'm gonna knock this guy out and he hit him with the hardest hit he can hit him with. And with tears in his eyes, he said, I thought that was going to fix it. He said, that didn't do anything but make it worse. And he said, the, the, the joy I thought I would get for paying him back for what he'd done to me all those years, it did nothing but make it worse. Don't try to get even with somebody. The only way you can free yourself of this prison is to let it go, to release it and ask God to help you. Cast those cares upon him. They're only punishing themselves. Many professing Christians have received forgiveness, but they have not been able to share this forgiveness with those who have done them wrong. We know what it's like to feel that, to experience, unfor to, to experience forgiveness, but yet we're unable to do that to somebody else. There are so many times where God, has, where God has showed me when I was praying about somebody who did something wrong. And I went to God and said, Lord, how do I get over this? How do I get past this? What they did was wrong. And God always reminds me, what about all the wrongs you've done and the mercy and the grace that I have shown you? Can you demonstrate that to somebody else? Then I have to repent. That's what I said. When you pray, God reveals what's in your heart and shows you where you have fallen short. Because I'm thinking, Lord, this person needs to pay for what they did. They need to be judged and he said well what about if you had to pay for all that you did what if you were judged for all that you did and I said Lord you know what I'm so sorry you have your way vengeance belongs to God let him deal with it let him work it out it's not up to you to decide to determine how God is going to handle it you release that God is the God of judgment he is going to take care of it Abraham and Sarah tried to help God. You know, God had promised them that, that, that son, the promised son, they didn't want to wait for it. They said, we're going to help God. We're going to take matters into our own hands. We're going to do it. But David, when Saul was searching and trying to kill him, he had an opportunity to murder Saul, to kill Saul. He says, I will not touch God's anointed person. I will not go against God. I will let God fight those battles for me in spite of everything they have done, in spite of me not understanding, in spite of me wanting revenge, in spite of me wanting them to pay back the debt that they owed. Let God handle that. Let, let God deal with that. Put it in his hands. If we live only according to justice, 
We will put ourselves in prison. We want them to be justified. We want everything to, to, to have them be judged because they deserve it. They deserve to, be, to, 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 to face the consequences of what they have done. But we put ourselves into a prison when we live that way, when we think that way. If we live according to forgiveness, then we are sharing with others what God has shared with us. Then we will enjoy freedom and joy. Some of us are just not happy people. We wake up mad. We wake up bitter. We wake up upset. We look for all the negative things in the world to talk about and to complain about. Why? Because we are holding unforgiveness in our heart. We're holding judgment. We're holding resentment in our heart. There's this, this study I'm doing and it talks about how these things cause sickness and illnesses when we can't release those things because we're so burdened down by it. We can't get past it. And I'm going to talk on some of those things, but, but God is here to bring joy and freedom if you can release it. And, and God wants us to be happy. He wants us to be joyful people representing him, the King of kings and Lord of lords. But as long as we hold on to these things, we'll never be happy. We'll always look for a way to, be, to, to repay what they, what, they, what they have done to us and try to find a way where we say, well, they'll, they'll get what they deserve one day. And we're looking and longing and hoping for that day. And see, I told you that they was going to come, but let God deal with it. Maybe there's things in their lives that are going on. They're facing consequences that you don't even know anything about. But God is a just God. He does not play favoritism. You know, the word of God says there's no more Jew, no more Gentile. There's no more black, nor white, nor Spanish, nor Asian. Or there's, there's no racism with God. He says there's no male nor female. There's some, there's some females that they feel like, you know, that because I'm a woman, you know, I'm being mistreated. There's some women that hate all men because they were abused by a man growing up. And so they're bitter to every single male in their life. There's no more male. There's no more female. God does not play favorites. And so you can trust God in that. Leave it in his hands. Let him do the work of judgment. We live according to forgiveness. We'll be sharing with others what God has shared with us. Peter asked Jesus for a measuring rod. Jesus told him to practice forgiveness and forget the measuring rod. Get rid of the measuring rod. Don't keep any record of that stuff. Throw away the measuring stick. Tell your neighbor this morning, say, get rid of that measuring rod. You don't need it anymore. Jesus warned us that God cannot forgive us if we do not have a humble and repentant heart. As long as you're alive and you're wanting revenge, that's not a repentant heart. And if you're living in your, in your life with holding a grudge and wanting revenge, the word of God says he cannot forgive you. We want God to forgive us, but we can't forgive others. We have to release it in order so that we can be forgiven. The Word of God says, he, 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 we reveal the true condition of our hearts by the way we treat others. Especially when they've done us wrong. It shows what's in your heart. We have to know when to turn the other cheek. Amen? Just because they've done you wrong, sometimes we'll act out in a particular way. When somebody has done you wrong... It causes the enemy to come into your mind and tell you, you know what, you could do this, this, and that, X, Y, and Z. You can plant some seeds. You could sow some dishonest seeds. You could set this person up. You could get back what they've, because of what they've done to you. When we are hurt, especially, it brings out our true character. It brings out the true condition of our heart. There are times where somebody has done me wrong. And man, the thoughts I had, Eric, about this person and the things I wanted to do to them. If I could just put my hand around their throat and then God showed me, is that truly what's in your heart? And God will use that pain to show you the things that you need to clean up through his Holy Spirit. But how many are glad that he gives us grace and compassion through the Holy Spirit to get through it and to leave it in His hands. Through those painful circumstances, it brings out what's truly in your heart. What about the things we say when we hang up the phone after a bad conversation? <laughs> I've had to repent for some of the things after I said after I hung up the phone. I said, Lord, I don't want to think this way. 
I want to have a pure heart, a clean heart, not only when things are going good. And the text I want to read next week is coming from Luke chapter 6, and it's talking about forgiving those who speak evil against you, not just the ones who do you good, but even your enemies, forgiving them and loving them. It's a powerful text because God wants to do something in your life, but there are some things he wants you to clean up and take care of. When you're... When you go through a painful circumstance, you think some thoughts. You want to do some things. And I said, Lord, where, where are these thoughts coming from? Th those thoughts are coming from the enemy. The enemy is telling you, go back and get what's yours. Go back and repay them. They deserve it. But turning the other cheek, it takes true strength, a repentant heart, humbleness, humility, to know that you have what it takes that lies in your power to take matters into your own hands, but still do nothing about it. That takes true courage. That takes true Christian maturity. What did Moses do when he got frustrated? He hit the rock. God says, that's it, disqualified. Saul, who was anointed to be the first king of Israel. What a powerful and amazing opportunity. He disobeyed God. God says, that's it. I've rejected you. So when we walk with God, the Holy Spirit will give us discernment. But there are things in our lives where we are faced with temptation to disobey God. And to take matters in our own hands. When I say to God, why are you allowing me to experience these pain? He says, I'm trying to see. Well, he already knows, but I'm trying to show you your true character. He says, you're saved, but I want to fix that. You're saved, but I want to make you a better person. I want you to love more. I want to, you to grow in your level of love by loving people who have hurt you. I want you to not think evil thoughts or say evil things about them when you hang up the phone. I want you to say, God bless them, forgive them, they know not what they do. And put your trust in me and allow me to work it out. Yes, you're saved, but I want a deeper relationship with you. I want a closer connection with you. I want you to demonstrate to the world what it means to love. Deeply love someone and to forgive. And he says, I'm allowing you to go through those things because I want to work some things out in your character to make you close. There were some hotheads in the Bible, weren't there? Saul, David, Samson, I mean, all those guys, Peter, they were ready. I mean, Peter said, who? He, who, he said, what? He did what? Come on, let's go. David said, who does this giant think he is defiling our God? He was ready. There were some hotheads in the Bible. God said, I don't want you to be a hothead. I know you can take matters in your own hands. He said, I want you to lay, leave it alone. Even though you can fight back, I want you to leave it alone. I want you to put it to rest. That record of wrong you have, I need you to put it in the sea of forgetfulness. Don't mention it. Don't even talk about it. Just let it go. And God wants you to be joyful and happy and free. He wants you to let go of those things that people have done to you. Don't keep record of it, but in the name of Jesus, release it so that you can move on with your life and you can no longer be a prisoner of what they have done. As I got off the plane Friday night, there was a young man that came up to me and he said, I don't have any kids. I, I have three nephews. And I said, do you live in Florida? He said, no, I'm in Alabama. He didn't use some nice words, use some profanity, but he says, I'm here to see my piece of crap dad. That's what he said about his father. Something his father has done along the years to hurt him, and he's holding on to that. There's people that said to me, I can't talk to them because 10 years ago, they said something, they did something evil, and I want revenge. That was 10 years ago. That person has moved on with their life. You're the one that's still a prisoner of it. 
Get over it. Ask God to help you get over it and to move on so he can do a new thing in your life. When, we, when, and when our hearts are humble and, re and repent, we will gladly forgive others. But where there is pride and a desire for revenge, there can be no true repentance. And as I close, the servant in the parable did not have humility. He was just glad to be off the hook. He was happy that his sin was forgiven. But he couldn't find it in his heart to do that for somebody else. I believe when you truly repented, when you, have, when you have truly repented, I think you can forgive others. Because you know what God has done for you. He was just happy that he was off the hook. His family wasn't going to be put into prison. There's people that said, Lord, if, you, if you'll take this thing away, if you'll fix it, if you'll get me out of this situation, I'll never do it again. And we go right back when God takes us out of that situation. God, if you do this, I'll never do this again. If you do this, I'll, I'll come to church and I'll serve you and I'll give you my everything. But how easy do we forget when God does answer that prayer? He was just happy to be off the hook. He wasn't truly repentant. He wasn't remorseful for what he had done. You know why God said, David is a man after my own heart? It wasn't because of the sin he committed. It was the remorse and the repentance that he had. A broken and contrite spirit. He truly, genuinely was sorry for what he did. And sometimes we're just glad that we didn't get caught. That's not true repentance. He was just glad that he got off the hook. But when he had to demonstrate that forgiveness and give grace and mercy, couldn't do it. When you truly repent and are humble... You can say, Lord, you have your way. I forgive this person. There's sometimes I'll send a text message to somebody f from my past who has hurt me, not expecting a response, and I'll say, God bless you. Just want to let you know I love you. I'm praying for you. Hope things are well with you and your family. Man, I'll get some nasty responses. Don't do that. Don't pray for me. I don't need you, this and that. Some of them will completely ignore it. But I'm not doing it for their response. I'm doing it because God has forgiven me. And it's a true heart of repentance. There's times my wife will say to me, how can you text that person and tell them you love them and you forgive them? I said, it's not the carnal flesh. The flesh in me wants to go grab their throat. But the spirit of God living in me that's given me confidence says, do this in honor of who I am and what I've done for you. Demonstrating that love. And as the head of my household, as a man... I'm showing my wife that there are things that people have done to you. By an example, it's the agape love. I'm not going to invite you to my house for dinner and be around my family and kids. I'm going to guard my heart, but I'm releasing that. I don't want to be a prisoner of the pain. I don't want any more sleepless nights thinking about it, worrying about it. I'm just going to leave it in his hands. When you truly repent, you can do that. You don't want revenge. You don't want to see them hurt. There's people that say, Lord, where they have hurt me. And, 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 and I mean, I would spend hours there. It's times I would spend three hours in prayer, literally crying, asking God for answers. And God will show me some things. And I'll say to God, you know what? I don't want this person to go to prison. You know what, God? I want them to experience your love. I want them to, for, to, to be forgiven. Lord, I want them to experience grace and mercy. That's what I want. And God says, that's the heart that I'm after. In each and every one of his servants, in each and every one of his children, when you can look at somebody who's done you wrong, you don't want them to get revenge. You want them to experience grace. You want them to experience mercy. You want them to experience a second chance. Why? Because you know what it's like to have a second chance. You know what it's like to have grace. You know what it's like to have mercy. And you want the same thing for them. That's where God wants us to be, church. But we got to let go of some things. In my final text uh, I'll be sharing from next week in, in, in the book of Luke's, Luke uh, chapter 6. In Ephesians 4 verse 32, he says, Be kind one to another, be tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgive you. 
So don't criticize people. Be tender to them. Sometimes we speak harsh to people because they make us sick. My wife said she was over at a family, um, with her family over at a friend's house, and, and that husband was talking to his wife. She was trying to, uh, um, his, the husband was talking, and she came to ask a question, and he said, what do you want? And that's not tenderhearted. That's not forgiving. That's not being kind. Be tenderhearted with people. Don't speak so rough and harsh, even if they do that to you. Sometimes it's best to say, you know what? I need to leave or I, I got to hang up the phone because if we continue talking, I'm going to say some things that I'm going to I'm going to regret and I'm going to have to ask God for forgiveness later because the thing that I'm feeling right now, the flesh that is coming up and the thing that I might say to you, I might regret it for the rest of my life. So maybe you need some distance. Maybe you need some space and that's OK sometimes. Say, so you know what? Let's talk about this at another time. You got to know yourself, know your weaknesses. Get yourself out of that situation until you calm down and ask God for help. Because you don't want to say things. The Bible says death and life lie in the power of your tongue. And so we have to be careful with the words we use with people. As that precious mother said to her son, I love you, be careful. Those were the last words he heard his mother say to him. She can rest at peace. He, knowing that, 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 that those were the last words he said. There are times at funerals people said to me, before they passed, we had an argument. We haven't talked. And they'll show up to a funeral to remember the life of someone who they haven't spoken to in 10 years. They say, you know, we didn't have a relationship. We haven't talked to each other in about 10 years. What a terrible way to remember your loved one. Be careful the words that we use. And, and my wife says to Haven all the time, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. Sometimes it's best to hang up the phone. Walk away. And just leave it alone. Amen? He says, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so also must you do. Amen? Will you stand to your feet this morning as we get ready to dismiss? Father, Lord, I come before you and I thank you for your people. Lord, thank you for the word that was given from the parable that you gave to Peter in the book of Matthew chapter 18 about the power of forgiveness, the power of letting go, the power of releasing that grudge and not holding on to it, the power of giving grace and mercy, Lord, not because they are deserving, but, Lord, you have forgiven us, Lord. So let us be tenderhearted and kind to our brothers and sisters in Christ, to our spouse, to our children, to our aunts and uncles, our cousins, our nieces, our nephews, our brothers and sisters in Christ, our spouse, Lord, on the job, in the workplace, our co-workers, Lord. Help us to be tenderhearted. Help us to forgive, Lord, not hold on to those things. Lord, we're only imprisoning ourselves by holding on to those grudges. Lord, it may not even make sense that we should forgive them, Lord, but we got to do it anyway because your word says unless we repent and have a humble heart, you cannot forgive us, Lord. And so we want to be forgiven of our sins. We want to be forgiven of our trespasses. Lord, your word says, Lord, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us oh God so let us forgive Lord let us release it oh God not hold on to it so we can sleep in peace oh God we can have true joy and freedom that comes from Jesus Christ Lord we pray for those that are here with with a hard heart oh God an unforgiving heart God I pray that you break the chains right now Lord I pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit this word Lord Father God will pierce their hearts I come up against the enemy's plans to take this word oh father god and to twist it to take this word oh god and to change it or to intercept this word lord i pray that this word will go straight to their hearts that by the power of the holy spirit they will experience deliverance oh god and the power of letting go the power of forgiveness so that we can mend the relationships that have been broken lord your word tells us that we ought to guard our hearts oh father lord so the, the, these things that we experience will bring out our true character oh god lord we want our 
our, our, our speech to sound like yours. Lord, we want our identity to be in Christ Jesus, Lord. We don't want to preach the gospel and look like the church, but then when somebody does us wrong, we flip them off in the middle of the highway because somebody gave us a bad drive or somebody honked the horn a little too long. Lord, let us have a true, pure uh, spirit of brokenness and humility of true repentance, oh God, forgiving one another, not speaking evil of others, oh God. Even though they have done us wrong, let us leave it in the past, oh God. Let us cast it into the sea, oh God, of forgetfulness the same way you have done with us, oh God. We trust you, oh God. Lord, and I pray that each and every household that is represented today, oh God, as they begin to forgive one another, even though they don't think this person is deserving, that they will let go of some things, oh God, that they will walk in true freedom and joy, and Lord, that you will give us peace that passes understanding, Lord, that we could sleep at night, oh God, we can get rid of the anxiety pills and the depression pills, oh God, because the joy of the Lord is our strength, oh God. Lord, your word says, laughter do it good as a medicine, oh Father God. Your word says that he that wins souls is wise. Uh, your word says in Matthew 6 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of its righteousness and all other things will be added unto you, O God. Your word tells us, Lord, not to worry about anything, O Father God. Tomorrow has its worries of itself, O Father God. But let us seek your face, O God. Let us trust in you. Let us walk in faith, Father God, knowing that you are the author and the finisher of our faith. You are Jehovah Jireh, our provider. You are Jehovah Elohim. You are El Shaddai. You are Lion of the tribe of Judah. You are the great I am. You are the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And we thank you, Lord, for who you are and for what you've done today and what you're going to continue to do in our hearts. Lord, yes, we are saved, O oh God, but you want us to have a sanctified, delivered relationship with you, O oh God. There are some, some things as we get closer to you, O oh God, as we have a deeper, stronger relationship with you, O oh God. There are some things that we might not even realize that places we have fallen short. God, reveal those things to us. Open it up to us, O oh God, so that we're not looking at the plank in somebody else's eye criticizing them when we have a log in our own eye oh god that you will use us oh god to be instruments of your glory that you will use us to represent the kingdom oh god that you will use us to love and forgive oh god that others will see the good works and glorify the father in heaven we ask all these things in your precious holy name one more time will you just put your hands together give god a great big hand of appreciation for who he is god bless you have a wonderful week and we'll see you next Sunday, Lord willing. Greet somebody. Tell them you love them. Tell them you forgive them. In Jesus' name, amen.